Today's guest is Will Potter. Will is an author, journalist, thinker, freedom fighter. He's the author of a book called Green is the New Red, which basically breaks down how the government has moved to label nonviolent protesters as terrorists after 9 11. He's got a ton of shit. He's a TED Talk felon. I mean, TED Talk fellow. <laughs> Check out this interview though, a lot of important shit we talk about, um, and if you want to know more about his work, check out his website, greenisthenewred.com. Will Potter, what's up, man? Hey, what's going on, man? Thanks for having me. Yeah, thanks for agreeing to do this a year and a half ago, and finally you coming to <laughs> hey, man, per- Perseverance. Right? <laughs> oh my god, man. Um, well, I guess I, I wanted to start there. Um... We met at like an after dinner kind of get together at Resistance Ecology a few years ago. And, um, you know, we didn't even really knew who each other were. We were just kind of hanging out and talking. And, um, and then I was like, oh shit, you're this guy, you know? <laughs> yeah. And I was like, oh shit, you're that guy. <laughs> <laughs> and I guess like, I think what really, what I, cause that was kind of my first time being around a lot of animal rights folks. And I was really struck by just how friendly and unpretentious everyone was. Um, do you think animal rights has changed a lot over the last 20 years? Yeah, well, I mean, I think there are a couple things going on. I think that's just is a really good crew. I mean, there's a lot of in any social movements, you have plenty of people that um, kind of do a disservice to the issues they're working on and are more interested in the, you know, showing that they're the most radical or the most whatever within their own scene at the expense of of being welcoming to people. And I think. Uh, that kind of group of people we're with in, in Portland is definitely an exception to that. And they, I think resistance ecology was a great project and they're still doing really great things. You know, with the movement in general, I think there's been massive, massive changes. Um, certainly in the last 20 years, but man, even in the last, um, couple, I think I'm just seeing things change pretty dramatically and very quickly. I mean, these issues that, for a really long time have been on the margins are becoming part of popular discussion more broadly and also part of kind of a left critique as well and i think there's a lot of problems and and difficulties with that and uh resistance to it um from the more traditional left but i think animal and environmental issues are really starting to work their way into that discussion yeah, for sure. I mean, someone recently I've been talking to folks who were uh, talking about like social insertion and how like the role of radicals really is to take ideas that are on the fringes and make them front and center. And I feel like that's what your work does really well. I think that's, that's definitely what I aspire to do. I mean, I I think really what I set out to do with my work is to talk about issues that are frequently marginalized as being radical or extreme or um, even within social movements, people don't want to touch it because it can be inherently dangerous. I mean, when you're talking about labeling people as terrorists, there's a lot of um, real risks of aligning yourself or being seen as aligning yourself with that and, and, and resisting that language. But I mean, what I'm trying to do is inject that discussion into more mainstream audience and i think i mean i'm just constantly amazed at how receptive people are to that that if you get rid of a lot of the the baggage of how i think people within social movements often talk about issues and you just try to be really direct and and honest and humble with people you can bring in a lot of people from very diverse backgrounds um that understand the dangers of of targeting people because of their beliefs. Um, you didn't start off as a quote unquote activist, right? You started off just as a journalist covering Shack uh, Stop Huntington animal cruelty protests, correct? Or no? Well, I, I kind of have a background in both, and they were 
on a similar tra trajectory. I mean, I got involved in journalism. I had my first newspaper job when I was 16 or 17 at the Dallas Morning News. Um, so, and that was around the same time I started learning more about political issues. Um, when I got to college, I did a lot of activism when I was in college. Um, but then I was on this very traditional journalism path. I mean, I went, I was kind of working my way up the newspaper food chain with bigger and bigger papers. Um, and then it got to a certain point where I couldn't, you know, couldn't do that anymore. I had my own FBI experiences, which, which certainly prompted that. Um, but I think that was kind of a path I was on for a long time. Um, most of this show is it's kind of geared towards like music crowds and trying to get people to think more about political issues. Um, and so I think like the the work you've done with like green is the new red and all that stuff. Um, I don't want to like I know it's a huge thing to talk about, but can you kind of just break down um, how that got started for you and what that like what that really means like the whole terror like uh, the, the animal enterprise terrorism act and all that stuff and how uh like how specifically the fbi came to you and asked you to start snitching on on these people sure so my kind of personal experience was i was working as a, a journalist at the chicago tribune and covering shootings and murders and breaking news and like i was saying i had a background in um activism in, in a lot of different causes in college and I was working on that all that horribly depressing stuff at the Tribune and I just felt like I was doing nothing good in the world I mean you know and it just that's not what I got into journalism for and so I was like you know I have to do something that makes me feel like I'm not just surrounded by death every day so you know, I just went out leafleting. Because, um, yeah, I mean, factory farming campaigns, that'll make you, that'll make you feel uh, better. You know, that's not that. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly, right? This, this is my, uh, this is, this is a lot about my uh, personal coping mechanism. <laughs> is for replacing one horribly depressing thing for another. So, but yeah, you know, I went out. And part of what was being around like-minded people, too. Like, I've been really withdrawn and doing the, um, you know, the professional thing. But we went out leafleting on this animal testing campaign against uh, a company called Stop Hunting and Animal Cruelty. That was the target of an international campaign um, that had been really successful and almost brought this uh, testing company near bankruptcy. I mean, they'd been showing how this company was had been exposed through undercover investigations, workers doing things like punching beagle dogs in the face and dissecting live monkeys. I mean, really egregious, egregious stuff. But all we did that afternoon was pass out leaflets uh, in a residential na neighborhood in you know I always say since I have the, just the absolute worst luck of anybody I know we were all arrested and what was supposed to be just a you know an, an easy Saturday afternoon was not um, and the charges were thrown out I mean that of course it's legal to pass out leaflets and so we quickly got that dismissed but I mean the, the reason that story is important is that a couple of weeks later two FBI agents uh, came to my door when I was getting ready to go to work at the Tribune and they knew all about me and all about my girlfriend at the time and knew all about you know different journalism grants I'd applied for and Fulbright and stuff like that and the long story short is they said that unless I helped them by spying and uh, infiltrating protest groups they'd put me on a domestic terrorist list and this was you know only a few months after September 11th and honestly it just scared the shit out of me I mean I was really ashamed coming from that, that bit of experience with social justice movements in college, um, I'd always thought you know, how I would respond in anything close to a situation like that. And, you know, I never thought about becoming an informant. I didn't do anything like that. But I was just ashamed at how much it affected me. It actually it made me afraid. Um, so it took a while after that to kind of process how to move forward um, but I kept really becoming obsessed with this issue and that's how eventually what led to me um, reporting more and more about it I ended up testifying before Congress about a law you mentioned called the Animal Enterprise Terrorism Act which 
is a bill that was passed by these corporations and lobbied for by these corporations, I should say. Uh, uh, that's so. I'm sorry to cut you off. Specifically, Alec, though, correct? Alec was involved, yeah, but it, it, the group of uh, industries behind it was even more broad than that. I mean, it was the pharmaceutical industry, the Cattlemen's Beef Association, the fur industry, dairy, chicken, poultry, Ringling Brothers, the, the pet food industry, uh, the University of California, because they do a lot of animal experiments. I mean, it was a really broad coalition that was all pushing for this secretly. And the reason they were, they were pushing for this law is that it's so broad that it labels all kinds of different animal rights activism as terrorism if it causes a loss of profits. Um, and that's how the law is worded. And that, you know, when I testified, I raised obviously very uh, constitutional concerns and concerns as a journalist about how this affects whistleblowers and boycotts, uh, undercover investigations, sharing on social media. I mean, how broad is this? And they kind of dismiss those concerns, but also acknowledge that the bill could be used against nonviolent civil disobedience. So, I mean, that's kind of a, a good example of the issues that I work on with green is the new red, uh, dot com, which is my website and also my book. It's focusing on how, how this happened, how protest has become labeled as terrorism and what that means for all of us. Um, yeah, I get. I mean, it definitely has huge implications for things happening now. I noticed with a lot of the Black Lives Matter protests um, and other, I mean, this this idea that like for you know disrupting business, you have to pay restitution. Right. You know? I mean, that's fucking. That's crazy, man. Have you ever foyered yourself? <laughs> that's actually what I should. Uh, I'm working on in the next couple of days because I'm working with a friend of mine at MIT, Ryan Shapiro. Oh, nice. Who who um, is, according to the FBI, the most prolific FOIA requester, and he's uh, an old friend of mine through through hardcore and through activism. Um, and we've been working together to get my FBI file and the file on my book um, and some others as well. And it's been a really long court battle in the FBI and Department of Justice are fighting it in a really unique way. They're actually arguing that releasing this information is such a national security threat um, to release these FBI documents that they need years and years to process the information. And they're arguing this really crazy theory called mosaic theory, which means that all information is a piece of a puzzle, and the FBI and Department of Justice are saying that they don't know how a bit of information about me or Green is the New Red might be used with other bits of information and essentially be a national security threat and, you know, lead to the next 9-11. And this is the kind of... Like <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, I, I'm, not, I'm not even making this any of this up, man. This is the language they're, they're – well, this is the language we know they're using, and we don't know what a lot of the things they're saying because they're saying it's such a national security threat that they can only talk about it in secret briefings to the judge. So we don't know what horrible things they're saying about – me or Ryan Shapiro or animal rights and environmental activists. Um, but that's a long way of saying in the next few days, we should get uh, Ryan Shapiro will get us part of his uh, project the first round of what will probably be about thousands and thousands of pages of documents. And within that will be um, a good chunk of information about me. So we'll see what's in there. Um, it's crazy. The, um, I mean, I don't know. I don't know why I believed any of it, but you know, Obama was this constitutional professor and he said all the right things. I mean, I, I, yeah, I yeah. I'm, I'm just totally shocked at what has happened under his presidency. I mean, do you know, it, what's crazy, man, is I feel the same way. Like no matter how jaded I am, both through being aware of these issues and, and the things we're talking about. And I think we were talking about this before. Like it was, there's an element of 
it's hard not to get wrapped up into it a little bit. I mean, even despite my politics and like critiques I have of, of power structures and electoral politics, I mean, there's a part of me that was still really shocked to see Obama being so bad on these issues. Um, everything from Guantanamo Wait, to... Wait, can you hold on a second? My dogs are freaking out. I'm sorry. No problem. No problem. Hey, quiet! Quiet! They, the the mailman is like their best friend. They just love it. Hold on a second. <laughs> hey, 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 hey! Sorry, guys, not today. Come here. In. Yeah, it's, my, my mailman is like kind of like hanging out with these dogs. Is like the he just loves it. Um, oh yeah, oh, it to be they seriously like him. I thought they meant like they're they're trying to eat him or something. No, they love him. I'm sorry. I'm sorry to cut you off. So um, oh, that's what. I was just saying with, you know, Obama, despite everything in all my own, you know, political critiques of um, electoral politics and and power structures and how everything works in this town uh, in Washington, D.C., I had not hope, but I mean, an element of, you know, I I didn't think it was going to be this bad. I didn't think he was going to turn his back on so many different things that he had promised, um, especially on the civil liberties front. And I think what it really reflects is that when you create these structures and, and you give people in power even more power and even more unchecked Authority, whether it's uh, indefinite detentions at Guantanamo or surveillance through uh, NSA, FBI, CIA, that it's very difficult for people in power to give up that power. And so no matter who comes into office after Bush, you, you see them embracing those same structures. And I think that's exactly what happened with Obama. Um, made a lot of promises and you know that hasn't hasn't come through on any of them especially on civil rights civil liberties issues uh and i guess that's one of the things i think about when um you know when you talk about your book your work you know br- or according to the FOIA shit bringing about the next 9-11 um do you think people in power are so threatened by the amount of popular resistance that is just popping up in you know post-occupy that they truly feel their power being threatened and so they know that the only thing left to do is become a totalitarian democracy i mean you know i i think it's a couple things um when i was researching the book i was reading a bit of this uh historian Richard Hofstetler who talks about the the paranoid nature of American politics. I mean, how power structures are always in this state of paranoia about themselves being threatened. And I think that's part of what's going on. And I think the environmental crisis plays into that as well. I mean, it's not a secret in even CIA planning, uh, Department of De- Defense planning, looking at the ecological crisis that is continuing to grow and seeing that in terms of national security, social unrest, domestic and international problems. Um, so, you know, I don't think that right now something just uh, like Occupy or environmental activists, you know, protesting the Keystone Pipeline is seen as bringing down the empire. But I do think it is viewed as having that truly uh, radical and destabilizing potential. Then that's how and, and why social movements are being treated in this way, that what's emerging and the power it has to resonate with such a wide group of people. I mean, we saw that in Occupy. Look, for all the critiques that people might have of Occupy, how it completely changed the popular discussion about class and economics in this country in a very short amount of time is absolutely incredible. I mean, the fact that we went from having zero discussion about class on, on mainstream media outlets to talking about this idea of the 1% on CNN, MSNBC daily is is a, a groundbreaking thing and I think reflects the potential of those movements to really tap into how people feel. 
Yeah. Yeah, it's, uh, I mean, that's arguably the best thing to come out of it, other than, you know, radicalizing a shitload of folks and getting people uh, connected. Absolutely, absolutely. Um, well, what about, what do you think about the nerd scare? I, you know, I think it's kind of part and parcel with uh, the, the so-called green scare that I've focused a lot of my work on. I think it really is all connected. Um, and by the green scare, it's this term that people have used to describe this crackdown on environmentalists and animal activists and how the FBI has labeled them as, quote, the number one domestic terrorism threat. And we see, you know, in my work, a lot of uh, significant overlap and copycat between the persecution of those movements and, and the repression of the kind of hacker security um you know, nerd culture as well, for lack of a better description. I mean, the, the outrageous prison sentences, the um, national security rhetoric, the surveillance, the use of informants, all these elements are present uh, in all of that operation as well. Yeah, I mean, I'm like, I, you know, I'm afraid to run tour sometimes because it's like, gee, am I going to get busted for, you know, being connected to these fucking, you know, right. What, Right. And so it's all part of that, you know, to, to like criminalize nerd culture, I think is a great way of uh, putting it. Well, and, and I think criminalizing people who, who care about their rights and are informed about them. You know, I think there's really broad elements within that culture of very, very different politics. I mean, from, you know, anarchists to libertarian to like weird offshoots of both things. Um, but I think the theme between all of it is that people or people who are educating themselves about their rights and how to protect them through things like tour and through PGP. And I feel that way now, using email encryption. I mean, I've seen in court cases how uh, the government has spun the use of PGP email encryption as if uh, the people being discussed are entering a so-called illegal mode. Like, <laughs> right. the fact that, you know, it's kind of like saying that me pulling down the shades in my office right now as I'm talking to you means that I'm going to beat a child. I mean, it's this uh, insinuation that people trying to use their privacy means they're doing something wrong. Yeah, and that's, I guess that's the thing that really fucked me up that I, that I really forgot about in the midst of all this is how 9-11 really you know, changed all of that. And because of terrorism, it was, we, I no longer have any expectation of privacy, you know? It's well, and I, th I think that combined with just how culturally we're changing, I mean, particularly with social media and with um, sharing and kind of like checking in at different locations and all this kind of stuff. As time goes by, I think this idea of privacy is becoming more and more um, kind of out of touch with how, and maybe that's not a good way of saying it, or I guess I should say forgotten, that people just kind of take it for granted that uh, everybody knows what you're doing all the time and there's not even an attempt to preserve that. Yeah, my, my wife hates that. It's like we're just con people are constantly snitching on themselves. Like, uh, you know, she'll be out with her friends and, you know, every single every time they do anything, somebody's taking a selfie and putting it on Facebook. And she's just like, Jesus, can't we just be in the moment? You know, right, right. Well, I mean, especially it shows. I mean, this that's one of the things that makes me feel oldest sometimes is being at shows and, and trying to really enjoy that experience and every all you can see is the sea of iPhones up in the air of people like trying to record it and they're never even going to watch it later but it's just you know recording it rather than uh, experiencing it yeah very alienating I've actually begun at my shows telling people to keep their I don't want to see any iPhones you know yeah yeah um, well I bet people are kind of pissed about that sometimes aren't they um, no I think they feel embarrassed you know oh okay <clears throat> but uh, because it's true it's like what you're gonna look at like this this blotchy uh, you know 
being of light bouncing around on a stage with like a distorted audio recording is like why would you want to look at why would anyone want to look at that you know right <laughs> right why not just enjoy it as it's happening right now uh you talk about you you mentioned hardcore music a lot um do you what what role do you think um music has to play in and i'm not just saying this to like big up myself or anything um but <laughs> i'm just like do, what role do you think music has to play in all this like what what function can it serve i, I think it's absolutely essential to all the things i'm talking about and just in social movements um and growing social movements i mean with hardcore that i mean that was a really influential thing in in my life personally i mean i think it's probably the most influential thing in my political awareness and how i got involved and aware of uh, so many different issues but i think it extends more broadly than that as well i think within music and that culture i mean as you know in your work like it, it's a chance it's an environment to take chances. It's an environment to tap into more raw emotions. I mean, you have people that are seeking out that kind of a feeling or that kind of a community. Um, you know, you the people who find themselves, I think, in those types of subcultures, whether it's punk and hardcore or hip hop or whatever, I think a lot of that that identity in who who we are as individuals really lends itself to seeking out that kind of political community as well. And I think it really goes hand in hand. And I mean, we see the, the potential of that. I mean, with the work that you're doing with um, so many um, bands that are able to translate complex political ideas into an entry point right. for for young people especially i mean i think that's what in a nutshell is the most important thing is having that entry point of saying like oh it's okay to engage in these issues like it's okay to think and talk about this and to be angry i mean that it legit legitimizes those feelings Along that line, um, when you were talking about joining up with the people doing the Stop Huntington animal cruelty leaflets, um, you were saying how you felt, you know, it was good to be around those people. Um, and what I've noticed is um, kind of like, I don't know, it's like this, I'm, I'm like taking this Hegel seminar right now, and so I'm just got all this shit in my head. Yeah. Um, yeah. But like, kind of like coming to consciousness and, you know, um, the like, coming to a form of um, fucking I'm not even going to try to break it down but basically like through these like like I never knew I wanted I, I knew I wanted to be in, involved in a struggle or whatever but until I actually hit the streets until I actually started being around a true culture of resistance and being around um, these experiences where I'm building trust and solidarity and we're having these conversations and that is shaping that shaped who I am and all of my friends are transformed through that process and now five years later everyone is doing all this amazing work and right. I feel like the same thing you know can be said for you it's like if you hadn't have been sometimes you got to just dig in and just fucking ruffle some feathers and see what see what pops up you know I think a lot of people get fucked up like they'll read a Gene Sharp book and think they have everything figured out for them when really a lot of it is like you know like doing this kind of work um the, the cultural experience of being in these environments is transformative as well, you know? Oh, uh, absolutely. I mean, that's a hundred percent how I feel about it. Like, I think it's really easy to, to have that desire for someone else to show you the way. And, you know, I'm such a, like a school nerd. I'll always turn to learning about other social movements and other eras. And exactly like you said, I mean, studying what worked in the past and thinking that's kind of like define the way forward for us. And it doesn't, I mean, I think looking back on my life, the, the most defining moments are the ones where you've been thrown in situations that there's no one else to turn to about how to do it. So you have to figure out how to do it on your own. And I think that's the real legacy I have drawn from 
you know, punk and hardcore scene was that there was just such a militant uh, belief in the potential of that, that, you know, whether you want to be in a band, you want to book a tour in Brazil, all right, man, go do it. Like, no one's going to do it for you. Like, if right. you want to, <laughs> if you want to tour the country, like, sure, you, you can do that. You can tour the world. You can do whatever you want to do. You want to make your own records. And I think that kind of mentality really shaped that uh, political culture I grew up in as well, that... You know, you want to shut down a multinational corporation? Well, go do it. Like, don't right. wait for any, don't wait for anybody else to do it for you. Uh, it's just this DIY approach to life. Yeah, I mean, I mean, you do so much shit. You know, like you fucking doing so much shit, and it's like, if I were you, I would feel like my work is never done. You know. Like, yeah, I mean, I feel kind of paralyzed by that most of the time. Yeah, absolutely. Like. It, I mean, I feel, I don't know, I've been struggling with this a lot, especially the last few months. I feel like with social media and everything, like you can create, um, not create, but like you share things that are good, right? And I mean, you know this with uh, on Facebook and Twitter and everything else, you put up some stuff about your shows and like what you're doing or you share articles, but it creates this perception of, like some idea of success when in reality, I mean, it's just a struggle every day, like trying to figure out what to do, what to focus on, whether you're making the right choices or not. Well, and again, it's like um, when you talk about social media, I, I, I struggle so much with this um, because I feel like, you know, when I first started rapping, I thought all I was going to have to do was rap, you know, right. like so much <laughs> of my time is spent like, you know, I've been like debating, am I supposed to start an Instagram now that like Twitter's becoming irrelevant and Facebook is a fucking mall? Like, like, eh. but it's like, I feel that like, um, you know, we've been, we've been, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? We've been engineered or, um, like psychologically we've been conditioned for this kind of behavior of sharing and social media. And it's like deep down, I just want to like opt out of all of that shit right now and just go back to an old school mailing list. But I know yeah. if I do that, I can't survive, you know? Uh, uh, yeah. I'm in exactly the same situation. Like I, I got into this work to be a writer and if you looked at how I break down my days and months and years now, like so little of that time is actually doing that work. I mean, it's doing speaking events, which I love to do and I think are really important, but that's like my, my only income source really writing doesn't pay anything. Right. So you got to do all, you got to do all the social media, all the email newsletters, all this kind of branding bullshit that is just how things are done now like I, I don't know a way around it. it it's so funny um i'm writing a song right now called my brand and um and it's like i was thinking about i mean i i know every it's not you know everybody hates chris hedges now but um you know chris hedges had a really good point about journalism you know he was saying that um, we're moving away from um, like real journalism that is supported by you know these media um, industries, and we're moving towards like celebrity journalists. You yeah. Know? So like you have to like have a fucking rock star journalist brand. You have to be Will Potter. You have to be um, Jeremy Scahill or Matt Taibbi. You know. Well, in at the same time and not to take anything away from y'all because y'all are doing fucking incredible work but it it doesn't you know what i mean it's not supported like you have to fucking do it completely diy right well exactly i mean and i think scale is a really good example of that too but i mean it's like how even if you are at that position in that like you feel like you have this brand or network or whatever like I feel like there are a lot of people who have been really really supportive of my work but like at the end of the day I don't know how to how to do it right now like you know I started writing for places like foreign policy and like these really prestigious publications who have zero budget anymore for investigative reporting so where does that come from like how do you 
and how do you get the support to actually do the work rather than just being someone who you know does social media and public appearances about the work i think that's what scares me most about journalism right now is you know there are very few people who are able to make a living doing this and the people who are at the more traditional media outlets are just turning to other journalists as their sources people like me who are independent um right. and that's not sustainable yeah, and it goes same for music. Um, well, I guess yeah, this, seg- yeah. this segue is good into my next question because this next project couldn't have happened without all these things we're discussing. Um, you did a crowdsourcing campaign um, for this drone idea. Um, right. Where So basically the idea was you were going to buy a, a fleet of an army of drones uh, or one drone and uh, you were going to kind of survey the environmental impact of factory farming and what other shit you can dig up, I guess. Um, right, where, right. Where, what, where's that project at right now? So, yeah, that's exactly right. And the, the project was really motivated by these new laws called ag-gag laws that make it illegal to take photographs or video of factory farms. And they've passed in about uh, half a dozen states. And so with this, I wanted to try to get these uh, drones to take aerial photographs and get an idea of the environmental impact, you know, the waste lagoons, the cattle feedlots, uh, how it's changing the landscape, and just to think more critically about this technology as well. So where it's at right now, I've gone out in the field um, several times for these investigations. I've looked at some dairy farms, um, gone out to the Midwest a couple times, and I'm starting to work with uh, another videographer as well to pull all this together into a bigger project. It's been a real learning curve, man. Like, <laughs> I'm a, yeah, I'm a, I really underestimated it, uh, to be honest. Like, I'm a print journalist by training. Like, I'm not a tech person, and I know the media coverage of anything related to drones right now is pretty much like. Yeah, you could, dude, you could just buy a drone out of Amazon and toss it up in the air and you're good to go. And there's truth to that, but like to do a project like this is a lot more complicated uh, than I was anticipating. But that being said, you know, I'm pushing forward. I think part of the spirit of the project is it's even if it's hard, even if, you know, I some days like feel completely over my head i'm like oh my god what, like <laughs> how am i going to do this like this is such a great idea but i'm just feel like i'm screwing up and i've crashed a drone and whatever like you got to push forward and i think that's where journalism is at right now too that you know you have to take risks you have to be creative um both in your funding which was, was really successful and i'm really appreciative of all the people that um believed in me to do this but also in how to execute it so that's what i'm trying to do right now yeah, it's um, that it's crazy. It's such an awesome idea. I just love it. Um, one of the, but one of the. I mean, again, I you know, there's all these contradictions. You know, within capitalism, there's so many contradictions in our daily life. Um, and so one of the, you know, the, this this idea of like using the master's tools. Um, so do right. you think there's a danger in like, you know, making non-militarized drones um like palatable for people you know what i mean or do you think they're already here so why would we not use them or, or- yeah uh, i'm, I'm kind of somewhere in between like i don't think we're at the we're already here so let's just throw up our hands and, and say this is a part of life because i don't i don't think we're there yet um you know, I have all those concerns going in to the project as well. I'm not so much about the military angle because I think what's described as drones for military purposes is not even comparable to what we talk about as civilians as drones. I mean, these are essentially are RC copters with a camera. I mean, that's it. There, right. There's no weaponized anything. So my concern more was on the privacy front. Like, how, how are we thinking about this as a culture? And ultimately, why I decided to do the project is because it seems to me like there's really these two competing messages we're being told right now. You know, one is that when it comes to 
the government and and the FBI and corporations having access to information about us, they could just have whatever they want. You know, whether it's NSA spying or Facebook skimming every imaginable information from your page and selling it off to corporations and, and whatever other thing, you know, they're just chipping away and we have no right to that anymore. Um, but when it comes to us as, as the people finding out what corporations and the government are doing, all of a sudden that's off limits. You know, all of a sudden we can't talk about transparency and, and privacy actually exists. So what I wanted to do with this project is, is to make people question why. Like, why can we not see what the agriculture industry is doing. Why would a corporation have a right to privacy when we as, a, as individuals don't have that right right now? And so really to kind of stir the pot a little bit and to get people talking and thinking about this. Um, I personally, I, I completely understand everyone's concerns um, with the privacy implications of drones. I think that's something we need to, to think through. Have you played that game um, that Randy Greenback made? With I that. have, yeah. <laughs> it's so funny, man. <laughs> That's pretty good. We, you, uh, yeah, you build up for the people who are listening who don't know. Uh, what's it called? The, what's it called? It's like farm factory farm, or is that what it's called? You know, what? I'm drawing a. I'm gonna look it up right now. I drew a blank on the name. Um, but you build. It's like a, a castle style game where you. Uh, build your factory farms with all these defenses to fight off things and uh, including things like fighting off uh, drones sent in to take photos of the farms. So it's, <laughs> it's called a fat chicken. Yeah, fat uh, chicken. Fat chicken. You can play it online. It's pretty cool. Yeah, it's, it's awesome. Um, so uh, okay, well, I only have a couple more. Um, what? What's it? I mean, I'm some. I'm one of those. You know, I'm 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 in the same boat as you. Like before, I was really in doing any kind of organizing. I was like a book nerd, just reading whatever Guy Debord off of a balcony. Um, right. And uh, but I I always love TED talks. Um, even when I'm horrified by them, I just love hearing what what these people have to say about themselves and their work. And like it's a it's a it's a combination of like dystopian ideas and like utopian ideas, you know? Right, right. Totally. Um, so like, what's that experience like being, a, um, you know, being a tenured TED talker? Like, it, it's pretty surreal. I mean, I like just being at the actual TED conference is a trip. I mean, you know, the way that it's structured and the way the organization works is, is pretty cool because it's, you know, people pay a lot of money to be at the TED conference, which on its face seems, you know, pretty messed up and exclusionary, but they have all these kind of high profile you know, people spending a lot of money to be there with a limited number of seats, and then they make all of the stuff that comes out of that conference free to everyone online. So that's how you get the videos and the really professionally produced talks and all that. But as a result, you're at the TED uh, conference, and it just, you know, I mean, I got lost going to a uh, this you know, kind of meet and greet thing I had to be at, and I turned around, I was kind of staring at my phone, and I asked somebody for directions. I looked up and it was Al Gore drinking, you know, an espresso, <laughs> which is just not the world. This, that's like, that's not the world I operate in. You know, are you seeing, I don't know, Hollywood celebrities and all that kind of thing. But what's cool about it is in that environment, that the people doing the TED Talks are in a lot of ways more of the celebrity, which is a really weird experience, like having people like that really engage and wanting to talk about your work and something that you've geeked out on for you know a decade, and all of a sudden you have these really kind of famous types want to ask you all kinds of detailed questions about it. Uh, it's pretty bizarre. So I'm going to be going back. I got this um, senior fellowship with TED, so that means I get to go to a few more of these conferences. I'll be going back in March. 
That's great. Um, yeah, I just, I just, I just wonder, like, like what kind of, like, you know, do these people say any crazy shit to you? I mean, does anybody like, you know, you know, does Al Gore pull you aside and say, you know, man, I, I really like the drone idea, you know? Yeah, I mean, you. That's exactly the kind of stuff that happens. I mean, like, I gave my the last one I was at. I did my talk, and then the rest of the time. Like I was doing media interviews and things like that, but you're also just enjoying the experience and seeing everyone else's talks in between stuff. It's, it's this really elaborate um, conference hall, and they've got free coffee and like fancy, you know, espresso and stuff everywhere. And so people are just hanging out, and you have just people like that coming up and chat you up about ag gag laws and, and eco terrorism and whatever. And it was really. Um, inspiring to me in a lot of ways because you realize like you can take these type of ideas um, and I think the legitimacy that TED as an organization kind of stamps on my work has helped in some regard too but you can take them in that very different environment and people get it I mean people were incredibly incredibly supportive um, TED as an organization has been incredibly supportive and I think that says a lot about um, you know how we need to just push and push to get these issues into that uh, kind of exposure um, are you, you're a vegan right? I am yeah um, so like the thing I kind of struggle with with vegan, first of all, there's very few vegans that I know that do anti-capitalist work in Denver. There's like, there's like a vegan grocery store here called Nooch, and there's some, there's a couple groups, but there's really not a lot of organizing here around veganism. And, you know, most people are concerned about foreclosures or whatever. And I guess I'm just curious to how you feel about, you know, like the kind of breakdown between like class and veganism, you know, how like you have, you know, these like people who eat this vegan food, but it feels divorced from animal rights. Right. You know, I think that is tied to what we were talking about before about changes in the movement as well. I mean, changes in how food is being discussed now you know the, the huge thing is talking about plant-based everything's plant-based and so like that it's almost a trend you have people like bill clinton and ellen degeneres and you know whoever else all these really famous people talking about being vegan or eating plant-based diets and i think it's a kind of a turning point in a lot of ways for these issues as a garners more and more mainstream appeal of maintaining the integrity of um, the beliefs that are motivating that. You know what I mean? So it's not just, you know, so, so the idea of being vegan isn't just here, go buy all this stuff, that there's a critique that's deeper than that, where you're, you're trying to engage with how we interact with the natural world and what that means. Um, so I think there's always going to be a, a wide range of experiences and ideas within that. But I think, you know, as a whole, my experience with um, kind of vegans and animal rights activists is that they're much more engaged in a wide range of issues and much more... Um, holistic and how they're thinking about like anti-capitalist issue, issues than a lot of people would expect. I think people are motivated to work on animal issues or whatever through a kind of very deep-seated passion that can sometimes be seen as being exclusionary to other work and it's not um, or at least it's not in my experience I think we all kind of have to find a way to work on the things that really drive us and, and kind of light us up without losing sight of all the other you know horrible things that are going on in the world yeah yeah it's uh I mean to be honest I just like I I didn't even really think it was possible to organize around this stuff you know until I went to the resistance ecology just because so many people in Denver you know are on this worker you know eat meat like the workers shit and like I don't know I've been so fucking poor and I never had to eat meat you know yeah and right right um well, 
Yeah, and I think, yeah it's, it's just shifting how we think about that too. And I think that's why it's important for, you know, if, if you're a vegetarian or a vegan and motivated to work on those types of issues to be engaged in uh, different communities. Like, I think it's really easy. I think this probably goes for all types of political work that you start seeing the scope of what's going on and it's, you're like, man, I don't want to have another awkward political argument with somebody. Like I want to be around my people. Like, you know yeah, what I mean? Totally. Like I want to be around people that I can let my guard down and I'm not having like, Thanksgiving style arguments about uh, politics and shit. And, and I totally get that. And I feel that way almost all the time. But at the same time, you got to push your comfort zones in, in, you know, get out to other communities and, and start sharing the types of things that uh, you're aware of and that you care about as well. Let me ask you a question. You don't have to answer this if you don't want to, but do you identify as an anarchist? You know, I always have a hard time knowing how to answer that question because, like, I feel I'm really closely identified with the heart of those politics. Um, I mean, my work is clearly very critical of power. And I think that's at the heart of um, anarchism. And that's at the heart of an anarchist critique is thinking critically about power structures. But I mean, there's, I, I don't identify that way per se because of the political baggage that comes with it and with how easily that word I think is embraced by people who are not actually living out those values if that makes sense and I think it, it kind of can shut down discussions um, so I mean even though that I think has really shaped in a lot of ways who I am politically like you know the the rise of that um, I guess period for lack of a better term of modern anarchist thinking especially around like the WTO protests in Seattle in the late 90s like that's when I was kind of becoming aware of political issues um, and that had a really big effect on how I think politically um, like when I was like oh I'm going to interview Will Potter all my friends were like ask him if he is an anarchist <laughs> <laughs> um so, okay, last big question is, what advice do you have for folks that are doing the kind of work that the state would try to target? Um, you know, it seems that, like, they're so good at just inventing laws to shut down shit when people are effective. So it's like, what should people be looking out for? You know, I think the most important thing is to remember that all this is happening because people have been incredibly effective at doing this work. And the reason that the state or corporations keep coming up with these new laws or new powers or new whatever is because they're adapting to that. And I think what that means for us is we need to remember that all of this is very fluid and in a lot of ways, it's going to be a constant. This idea of government and corporate repression will always be there. I mean, there will always be that pushback, and it's going to fluctuate based on how effective these social movements are. And I think when I say that, I want to emphasize to people that that doesn't mean we just kind of say that this is all hopeless and we curl up in a ball and say, you know, there's nothing we can do. It's always going to be, um, you know, these repressive measures and there's always going to be the state pushing back against us. I think we just have to be aware of it and recognize that, all right, the more effective we as social movements become, the more intense the backlash is going to be. And you identify that as an obstacle obstacle rather than a goal and, and I think what I mean by that is I think a lot of times when we talk about for instance uh, you know militarization of police at protests you know anyone who's been in mass protest knows that things can escalate really quickly with the, the riot cop uh, situation and there can be scuffles with the police and people can focus on so much on police movements and everything and I always just try to remind people that like they're just an obstacle to us getting where we want to be they're an obstacle to the purpose of that demonstration they're not the focus of it so in my work 
you know, I want to emphasize to people that all these horrible laws and things I write about, I'm highlighting them because there are obstacles that we need to be more um, quick and strategic in overcoming. I mean, they're not the end. I mean, there's they're something that we can push through. Right, right. Um, yeah, I mean, I, uh, it's, it's, uh, it, it does get scary sometimes, though, you know. Oh, without a doubt. Without a doubt. Um, and, of course, we push through, and then we're fully liberated and living in a utopia. <laughs> there you go, man. We got it, all, got it all planned out. That's the game plan. So you're the new Gene Sharp. That's what you're saying. This is your... Uh, over- <laughs> no, that's, that's not at all what I'm saying. This, this, is, your ten point, this is your 10-point plan. <laughs> I do not have... Man, I don't, maybe I should do a 10-point plan. <laughs> for BuzzFeed or something. We're talking about branding and social media. But uh, no, you know, I think what we're talking about, that fear in that all those emotions that we just have to be upfront about. Like, it's all right to be afraid about this stuff. It's all right to feel completely dark and overwhelmed. And I think that's what really um, emphasizes how important community is that we're talking about before that you need people that are going to help pull you out of that when you have the really bad days in that when you feel like this is just too overwhelming Um, and you need people that inspire you to 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 demand more and to start thinking more uh, holistically about what we can accomplish and man it's not going to be about a 10 point plan <laughs> like yeah, so. you know in, in any group or organization that says they have that I think we should be very wary of um, it's about empowering us you know more horizontally more as communities as, and, and as individuals rather than trying to look to other people that have some plan for us Perfect. Uh, do you have any other? Oh, you know what? The only other thing I'd add to that, and also people need to learn to forgive each other. Um, like people, this shit's stressful, and people do crazy ass shit, and sometimes people fuck up. And um, you know, I think folks need to give each other space. You know, to, to fuck well, up. Absolutely, and and also to realize that this isn't a competition to be a certain, um, you know, avatar of what it means to be an activist or a radical or whatever. You know, I think what drives me so crazy about um, being involved in these types of issues is you see how just merciless people can be with each other. I mean, you, you see the scope of this horrendous stuff happening all around us, and yet you go on... Twitter and Facebook and Tumblr and the kind of radical community is just devouring itself over anything like and not to say that there aren't important things to that people have been called out on and, and, and have these discussions about. But I think people need to turn it down a few notches about and like you said, be more compassionate and forgiving with each other cut each other some slack and recognize that we're all trying to like figure this out and move forward and and I think in the process that makes uh, these issues more inclusive to everybody else as well and helps bring in new people yeah, I mean, I just, I mean, I, you know, you know when I'm talking about Chris Hedges, you know, I'm talking about him saying yeah, yeah. black block was the cancer within Occupy, and then when Zizek came out and said we need a Stalin, you know, right? Like, and then everybody's like, we can't quote Zizek anymore. It's like, dude, Zizek is just a fucking poet. Like, like right. who care? Like who cares what these people say? Like, take take what you can of value and leave the fucking shit you don't like. You know, like no one's no one's forcing us to. To, um, agree with everything every person says, you know? Oh, absolutely. And, and I hope that's, you know, that's kind of the spirit I approach my work too. Like I, I try to be, do the best I can. And if I hope, you know, if I screw up or if I say something wrong, I hope, you know, people will cut me some slack because I want to cut other people's slack on it too. I mean, it's kind of like saying like, I love uh, fiction. I love to read, but man, Hemingway was an asshole. Well, you know what? He was, (laughs) but there are a whole lot of people who have done a lot of important work had a lot of asshole tendencies in their lives. Yeah. You know, that doesn't mean you just discount 
uh, someone's body of work, like you said, you take what you can from it and also recognize that we're all very flawed. Yeah, like today, if Emma Goldman was at a meeting, someone would tell her she's taking up too much space. <laughs> <laughs> right, right. I'd be like, well, uh, Emma Goldman, I'm, I'm glad you're here and everything, but are you vegan? <laughs> well, <laughs> like, maybe we should step back from that. <laughs> Uh, touche. All right. Well, any 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 last words? Any any anything you want to shout out? Uh, no, man. Well, I hope everybody. Uh, thanks again for uh, talking to me about all this stuff. And if people want to check out um, my website, it's greenestthenewred.com, and um, my stuff's on that uh, the TED Talk website as well at ted.com. Awesome. Yeah. Tune in next time. Dog Colony to the threat. Whenever that is, with whoever that is. I never talk about how I'm a vegan Cause I recall how cats used to rub each other's nose in And also what kind of shoes are those? All I know, I prefer a couple dogs to most human beings Used to pick veins on my chicken legs Till I find out how hot dogs are made Always treated like a personal choice But changing your habits was little to defend Those who have no voice Shouts to Charlotte's web and the pets we kept R.I.P. to those who died in a cage Playing God, it's harder than you think Ask anyone who's had a salt water tank And I don't get how full life is Wanna save a fetus But I'll wash your cow's skull And the milk until it bleeds You drink pus and blood And your milk and take the food That I'm eating is strange I've been vegetarian for 24 years My bones don't break It ain't your fault Your society is sick It's from so many forms of prejudice That you escape blame So they will view all life on earth as the same Take nothing to feeding pigs You wouldn't need a dog Even though pigs are smarter And feel the same pain I can't Stampede of videos of cows squirming her long conveyor belts. San Francisco Zoo was a depressing place, so cold, so out the animals, they were sad, shouts to the Siberian tiger, Tatiana, them all those dudes after they threw shit at her, escaped the cage and wandered the grounds for half of an hour until she found them in the cafe, they ain't laughing in their graves. Everybody loved Jumbo the elephant, but he was trained with a bomb razor spear. Kept in a cell for most of the day. Was so depressed and angry as mean I had to get him drunk to perform. Enough of all mankind, though, your nature's brutal. Still the booms and busts and droughts. But we're supposed to be better than that. And our bodies were designed to eat meat. Cause our intestines run 30 feet. And our teeth are a razor sharp. In our claws, our fingers evolve for picking fruit and building shit. Not trying to tell anyone how to live, but next time you eat an egg, think about a chicken's period. Not trying to be on a soapbox, but picture your dog or your cat in a slaughterhouse. Grass grows through cracks, sidewalks out, recognizing.